old school Christmas. All right, well, hey, happy Sunday. Merry Christmas. Uh, special welcome to all of our friends live here at the City House. Uh, our church family, welcome to the family of our church family. We want to welcome all of you, your friends who are in town, or maybe you're here for the very first time, wherever you happen to kind of fall on that spectrum. I hope you know how incredibly grateful I and we are that you decided to worship with us today. I also want to send some love to our extended church family online. If you're traveling for the holidays, th thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, really excited, and I don't know if you know this about me, but I genuinely love Christmas time. It's amazing to me how many people really hate Christmas time, and it becomes very apparent very quick when you talk about it. But I'm not one of those. I love Christmas time, and how it, it reeks of cliche. I'm going to say it anyway. It truly is the most wonderful time of the year. And I think the thing about Christmas that causes me to love it so much is the tradition. So you get to know my family and especially my extended family. Tradition is a big deal in the extended Cackley family. In fact, we have to be very uh, careful not to do something two years in a row because if it happens twice, it is officially deemed a tradition and we have to do it until either one of us dies or Jesus returns. So you gotta be careful. And one of my favorite traditions of all time was on this day. Every Christmas Eve, we would always go over to my grandparents' house before they passed away. And we would do the exact same thing every single year. See, sometimes predictability is a beautiful thing. And there was never a deviation of the plan. We would show up and we would always eat tacos together. Because let's be honest, nothing screams Christmas more than tacos. And I don't know what you think of when you hear the word taco, what I mean is imagine the most white people tacos ever. Uh, I mean, she was a survivor of the Great Depression. So we're talking like tomato paste, salsa, unseasoned meat. And that's just how I ate tacos my whole life. We didn't know any better until my mind was blown one day when I discovered seasoning. <laughs> and then we would do that. And we, she lived directly across the street from this little Baptist church. They attended their whole lives. And we would walk across and attend a service and we would do the candle lighting and after service we were always so excited as kids because then we would walk back to her house and we would open not presents per se but we would open our boxes now something you need to know about my grandma is that she would all year she gave each of us a cardboard box that she would decorate with what i'm pretty sure is now in retrospect wallpaper and we each had our own wallpapered box, and my grandma was like a bargain ninja. She was like a sommelier of the clearance rack. And it was amazing to me. Like, we would sometimes return items, and they didn't even know how to return them because it had been so many years since that item had been purchased from their system. And this, like, fascinating sociological phenomenon happens, and I don't know if this is just my family, maybe you've observed this, but something happens as people get older in life that they can no longer correctly pronounce the name of the retail store that they're shopping at. <laughs> so my grandma, she had never been to Kohl's before, but I'll tell you, that lady was swimming in Kroll's cash. <laughs> she loved Kroll's. And when I was in high school, every once in a while, we would get a nice Amber Crombie and Fitch sweater or a Tommy Hemflinger t-shirt. She loved to go to Jones's, remember the Jones store and Penny's, which come to find out still exists. I didn't know that till first service. Incredible. And she would give us the craziest presents, y'all. I'm talking the craziest stuff. I remember one year she got me, and these are not ironic gifts. Like, ironic gifts are cool now. This is pre-ironic gift days. One year she got me a necklace, and it looked like my rap single was about to drop because it had a cross like this big. I think it's the reason why I went into ministry, actually. Uh, one time she gave me a, a ball cap that the, the bill, once again, Hand on my digital Bible. The bill, I'm not exaggerating, was this long. <laughs> Eventually it just cracked in half under its own weight. 
my favorite gift, however, which I'd forgot about, my mom reminded me of and thanked me for not sharing in first service. Uh, one year, she, my, my grandma is the purest, most godly woman you have ever met. She had a members-only jacket, just to give you an idea, that she, with a magic marker, wrote on the back, I love rock and roll. God is my rock, and I'm on his roll. <laughs> so that's, my grandma did not tolerate sin. She's a godly woman. Bought my brother one year a T-shirt that said hauling and had a donkey in the back, and she had no idea what it meant. <laughs> and still to this day, that T-shirt gets brought up. Craziest gifts, right? The worst, the worst gifts. And I remember as a child, like, I would forget, you know, and I'd get, like, excited again. I'm like, no, this is the year. It's going to be good. And you'd be, like, so disappointed and now, though, in adulthood, like looking back, I can honestly say those are some of my fondest memories of my entire life. Like I would give every dollar to my name to go back in time and to share that moment in that room with the wood paneling and the 70s furniture with them. Again, there's something about Christmas that it stirs something deep within us. I remember I was in a counseling session this year and we were going through an exercise, and my counselor, he was just trying to establish like a baseline. So it was like, find a place that feels safe, a place that feels joyous, a place that feels like all is right in the world. And I sat there, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I kept going back to that little Baptist church, standing in front of a pew, holding a candle, singing carols with my, Christmas, with my family. It was the safest moment in my life. And I know not everyone loves Christmas, but I think most of us do. Because there's something about Christmas, and it's, it's difficult to put into words at times. But there's something that's like a returning back, a restoring back to what was good. A redeeming. A, a return back to hope. A return back to innocence. And a return back to wholeness. And the question I want to pose for us this morning is, could it be the reason why we get so sentimental, we feel this deep, visceral joy and emotion towards Christmas, could it be more than just Craig's and yours childhood nostalgia? But could it be because there was a historical moment that took place in human history where there was a literal return back and a restoration? All that was broken was made right. All that was undone was restored and made whole again. And that's what I want to talk to you about briefly this morning. We are in a series, this is week three, our third and final week, that we're calling Old School Christmas. And the idea behind it is lessons that we can learn about Christmas from the Old School or the Old Testament. Thus far, we've looked at a passage in the book of Micah. In week number two, we looked at a passage in the book of Isaiah. And today, I want to land the plane looking in the book of the Old Testament by the name of Jeremiah. And just for some quick context, because I know that time is of the essence this morning, Jeremiah, he was a, an Israelite priest that served the southern kingdoms of Judah. And he served Judah at a very interesting time. It was the last couple decades before ultimately what would be their demise. And the primary ministry of Jeremiah was to preach a message of repentance, to repent, to turn away. To, to change the lies that you've believed and re replace those with truth, to turn back towards God. He would call them, God speaking through him constantly, to turn away from their evil practices, to turn away from their idolatry. They began worshiping these pagan Canaanite gods. And the message was, if you don't, if you refuse to heed these warnings, ultimately destruction will come upon you by the hands of the Babylonians. And that's exactly what would take place. And so it's against that backdrop I want to begin reading this morning. Jeremiah chapter 23, and we're going to begin in verse number 1. And God says this. He says, Woe to you, what's that word? Shepherds. It'd be easy at first glance to read that and to think that he's only talking to pastors or he's only talking to spiritual leaders. But in this context, it's an overarching shepherd. God is saying, like, all of you leaders over Israel, you failed. 
that you've been corrupted, that you've abandoned the covenants that you made with me. That their political leaders, a.k.a. their, their kings had failed them, their priests had failed them, the other prophets had failed them. Instead of their leaders protecting and feeding and nurturing and guiding, instead they had abandoned, forgotten, and betrayed the people. And because of this, God is ticked. And he says, woe to you, shepherds, who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Verse 2, therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. That because you have scattered my flock, so this is in reference to because the Israelites and their leadership refused to listen, refused to repent, Babylon has come in, conquered, they've plucked up the best and the brightest, the most influential, and they have now began to exile them back to Babylon. And can we just for a moment attempt to empathize with what Jeremiah is feeling in this moment? Inevitably, some of his own friends, possibly his own family, before his very eyes, are being taken away as exiles. History tells us that some would escape the Babylonians and seek a refuge in Egypt. Ironically, coincidentally, the same place that Jesus would live as a refugee. Jeremiah, he sees his own people being shipped away as exiles, knowing that for some, this will be the very last time he would ever see them for the rest of his life. God says, because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all of the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. So here God is referencing a historical event because remember, the Bible isn't just kids' stories. These are historical events that took place unfolding throughout human history. God is talking about an event that would take place in the year 538 BC when he would begin to return back the exiles to Israel. And he makes a promise. He says, I'm going to bring you back but when I do, it's not going to be, I'm going to restore you back to a place where you were before you were conquered. No, 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 because you were kind of a dumpster fire back then. Like, we're going to go beyond that. Like, we're going to go above that. I'm going to restore you back to a place of flourishing, a place of health and prosperity. Verse 4. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified. Nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. God establishing that your current leaders are terrible, but the good news is this, that one day I will raise up leaders worth following. I will raise up leaders who are people of godliness and integrity, and that's exactly what God would do. He would establish leaders like Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Joshua, Haggai, Malachi, and Zechariah. Verse number five, and this is where the story begins to just really come alive. It says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous, what's that word there? Say it with me. Branch. A righteous branch. A king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. Okay, so here's what I want us to do. Could you just for a moment forget that you are an American living in the 21st century? And could you attempt to see this verse, this promise, through the eyes of and hear through the ears of someone living in the Middle East in 600 B.C. Because if that's you, for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years, generation after generation after generation, you've heard a prophecy that there will be a future king, that there will be a Messiah, and he will make all that is wrong right. 
and he will redeem and he will restore Israel. And all along in this prophecy, you've been told that this king will come through the line, the lineage of David. Here's the problem, though. Rewind one chapter to Jeremiah chapter 22. And God has said through the prophet Jeremiah that there's a king in Judah by the name of Jeconiah, who is a descendant of David. And God says, none of Jeconiah's offspring will reign as king. And unfortunately, he was kind of the last hope. So in the mind of the Israelites who had believed this promise and had been passed down this promise from generation to generation to generation, the family tree of David has officially been sawn off and only a stump remains. Said another way, hope is lost that a new king is coming. Fast forward one chapter to Jeremiah 23, and now God is saying something new. He's saying, from the stump of David's line, I'm going to shoot forth a new branch. Do you guys see what's happening here? The new branch is Jesus, y'all. The original message of Christmas, the original message is that in the midst of hopelessness, God will bring hope from the most unexpected place. The message of Christmas started that for those of you who feel hopeless, you feel overwhelmed, you feel financially ruined, you feel like you're overcome by your emotional, mental, spiritual, physical struggle. That you feel like you're too far gone. You've exhausted mercy. You've exhausted grace. You're, too, you're in it too deep. The pit is too strong. The addictions are unbreakable. The message of Christmas is that God will take what man sees as a stump and he will bring forth a branch of hope and that hope is named Jesus. This is what Christmas is all about. That hope is never lost. That we serve a God that keeps his promises. It doesn't matter if you see a stump, he will bring forth a branch. That hope is on the rise. We're told that Judah will finally have a king worth following. A king that will usher in goodness and justice. A king that will reign not just over Judah, not just over the southern and northern kingdoms, but the whole world. And then Jeremiah goes on and he tells us the name of this new king. He says in verse 6, In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord our, what's that word? Righteous Savior. That his name will be righteousness. So you may be here this morning and think, uh, Craig, this is really good. Doing great, man. Super great. Super appreciate you. Thanks so much for this. Good history lesson here. Uh, I just don't know what any of this has to do with Christmas. So we establish that this Messiah, this coming king, would come through the line of David, right? We've also established that the remaining heir, Jeconiah, God's already said, hey, your offspring, they're not the ones. What's that uh, old, uh, they are not him. You are not him. They're not him. So it feels like kind of a hopeless situation, right? Feels like this is kind of one of those uh, impossible to resolve deals. That is unless God would choose to use a virgin named Mary to bring forth a savior who wouldn't you know it just so happens to be in the line of David. Joseph wasn't from David's line. 
but Mary was. And this child that will come from the womb of Mary, birthed from a supernatural miracle, he will be given many names, but one of his names is that he will be called righteous. Specifically, the term the text uses is the Lord is our righteousness. Now, we're reading this today, right? Thousands of years later in English. This in the original Hebrew that it was written, that English phrase was summarized in two words. Jehovah Sekinu. That the Lord is our righteousness. One of my favorite verses in all of the Bible is found in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. I'm going to read it to you in the New Living Translation. It says, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with a clothing of salvation, and he has draped me in a robe of righteousness. You want to know why Christmas matters? You want to know why we as Christians get really excited about this baby in a feeding trough and we celebrate it every year? Instead of just telling you, I want to show you. And I've invited uh, Andrew to come out and help me with this. So I'm not a big visual aid guy, okay? So you guys are going to have to give me some grace this morning. I asked Andrew to come out because if we're being honest, the majority of the world, the majority of those who live a life apart from Christ, this is how they live. They live a life wrapped in a robe of shame. They live their, a life wrapped in a robe that is a reminder of their sin, their brokenness, their false identities, their biggest regrets of greed and anger and malice and hatred, and ultimately it's pride. It's this desire and belief that I will be my own Lord. I will be my own God. And because of this, when we live a life wrapped in a robe of our own shame and our own sin, we fail. We fall short. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And what we deserve when we live in this way is to be eternally separated from a God in, in a place known as hell. But the good news for us is our story doesn't end there. That there's this beautiful gift called grace. That we're told that when we put our faith and our trust and our hope in Jesus, that something incredible happens. Doesn't Andrew look good in silk this morning? We're told that the blood that Jesus shed on the cross, in fact, the biblical author John in 1 John chapter 1, he would use this language that the blood that Jesus shed, it covers, it cleanses, it washes. So, so where are those scarlet letters now? Where's the shame now? Where's the regret now, they have been covered through the work of Jesus. We deserve to shed our blood. He shed his blood on our behalf. And then our sin is separated as far as the east is from the west. It's a remarkable reality. But here's the problem. For most of us, this is where our comprehension stops. And truth be told... This only represents half of the story that we need to know. This only represents half of the narrative and the significance behind why Jesus in a manger, God taking on flesh to live amongst us, became the greatest news to humankind. 
We're told that through Jesus, we are justified. And justification takes place in two steps. Step number one is that we're forgiven. Praise God. All of our past, all of our sin, all of our mistakes, they're washed why? They're, they're washed and they're cleansed. They're, they're removed. The bill is paid. But this, this only makes us morally neutral with God. This only wipes the slate clean. We need more than just having our sins removed. We need to be seen favorable in God's eyes to spend eternity in his presence. We need a king, church, whose name is righteous. We need not only to be wrapped in a garment of salvation, we need to be wrapped in a robe of righteousness. But here's the problem. I'm not righteous. I have no righteousness of my own. And you have no righteousness of your own. That on our own, we will never be seen as righteous. This is why the miracle of Christmas takes place. It's not only does Jesus come and forgive us. Now the theological term is that through Jesus, we have been granted imputed righteousness. Meaning that before, when God looked at you, before Jesus, he saw all of your sin, all of your shame, and you were condemned. But now through Jesus, he has given you the righteousness of the Son, and he has wrapped you with it. When he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when we begin to comprehend that, shame melts away. When we comprehend that, guilt melts away. Lies melt away. It's never been about what we have done. It has always been about what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. Why does Christmas matter? Why do we celebrate a baby born in a manger with animals and wise men and shepherds? Because that baby would grow to become a man. And he would live holy, spotless, pure, perfect. And he would hang on a cross in our place. And because of his shed blood, not only are we forgiven, not only are our sins covered, but he would give the greatest gift of mankind that he would give us his own righteousness. One of the greatest lies that we see, one of the greatest challenges as people go through crash course and find your place, the lies they believe about what God believes about them, how God sees them. It's like, well, yeah, I, I, I've forgiven myself, I've asked for forgiveness, but I really think that God still sees me as this. This is how God sees you. If you are in Christ, because of Christmas, because of a child, this is how he sees you. Romans chapter 5, the righteousness of Jesus has been granted to you. Therefore, death has no claim on your life. Therefore, the guilt of your past has no authority over you. Therefore, the lies that maybe you are father or parents or enemies spoke over you have no authority over you because you are clothed in the garment of salvation and you are wrapped in a robe of righteousness. Amen. Pray with me. I just, God, I just struggle at times to comprehend how ridiculously generous you are to us. I deserve none of it, Lord. I deserved death. I deserved separation. I was living in rebellion in my heart. But because of your great love, because of a love that was incomprehensible for humanity, you would leave the perfection of heaven and you would enter in to our story. That you would come vulnerable as a baby. That you would enter into human weakness. 
You would face every temptation that we would face, but yet where we failed, you would remain the victor. And Jesus would overcome every temptation, every enemy, every lure, every siren song, and he would walk in absolute holiness, and he would model it for us. And ultimately, it was a road that would lead to the cross. And every sin I have ever committed, every sin that I will commit today, every sin that I will commit for the remaining days that I have left in my life, Jesus would pay the penalty for those on that day in Calvary. And because that manger would lead to a cross, that cross would lead to a tomb, and that tomb would lead to a day that death was conquered, would lead to a day of resurrection. And Father, you have given us that, that we now can be seen as righteous through your Son, Jesus. I can think of no greater gift this Christmas, Father. So because of that, Lord, lies have no place here. Because of that, we are told and promised that there's no condemnation over our lives. And the only weapon the enemy can use is lies. So we replace that with truth. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want to take a moment here, maybe for you, For honest, you live apart from Christ. The Bible describes the road that leads to destruction as wide, meaning that the majority of people will choose to live their own way. The majority. That regardless of what religion people check on a box, true Christianity will always be a vast minority. The true way of Jesus, narrow is the gate. And if we're here and we're honest this morning, when you see the first robe, like that's your life, that you still carry the weight of your own sin, and you're trying to do life your own way, and this morning, what God is doing is he's drawing you to his son, Jesus Christ. He's drawing you back to a place of repentance. He's inviting you to an easy yoke to stop carrying the crushing weight of your life, to lay it at the foot of the cross, to receive the free gift of salvation that comes only through Jesus and exchange be forgiven and be made righteous in his sight. And if that's you this morning, I wanna say a prayer. And I always wanna preface this. In fact, I don't even do this that often anymore because I'm so worried that people will believe a lie that because I said a magical prayer, now I'm changed. Words are just words. These, they're, what I'm looking for is a posture of the heart. What Jesus said is discipleship is there's my cross, pick it up and follow me. So the, the invitation to follow Jesus is the invitation to die. And what I mean by that is the invitation to no longer live as you're in control, your Lord, but now Jesus is King. And if that's you, if you want to begin this new way, it's a way that I believe that leads to life and life fully alive. It's a way that you don't have to carry the weight of your shame. It's a way that you don't have to pay the bill of your own sin. It's costly and it's hard, but it's beautiful and it's good. And if that's you, I want to just invite you into a prayer this morning. You can say it out loud. You can say it in your spirit, but just say, Dear Lord, I thank you that I now have a king whose name is righteous. So in this moment, I call upon the name of Jesus. Would you forgive my sin? I failed countless times. I deserve death, separation, but instead I ask for grace, forgiveness, and mercy. I thank you that my sin is now washed, covered, and cleansed. And I thank you now, Lord, through the free gift of salvation that comes through your son, Jesus Christ, that I am made righteous. I have no righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ has been given to me. Help me today, Lord, 
to live as someone who is called. Help me to remember when I fall, because I will fall. And your word says that when the righteous fall seven times, they'll get up again. So help me keep just getting up every time, picking up my cross and following you. I thank you that this was the moment of Christmas, the moment of innocence restored, the moment of all that it was broken, redeemed. And I thank you, Lord, that even though I was living as an alien and an outsider, now I can be called a son and a daughter. I love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here's what we're going to do. We've just been contemplating kind of the, the light that Christ brings through his word. And now we get to celebrate that through song. And my encouragement to you is if you made the decision to begin to follow Jesus today, don't keep that to yourself. I pray that, and I hope that you would tell somebody. Find one of our staff, find me, find out. We're going to talk about some people praying up front. Let us know online. Let us know on a connect card. Let us know. We'd love to just get you some next steps and celebrate that decision with you. But we're going to sing some uh, carols together and uh, light some candles and be reminded that Christ is the light that permeates the darkness of this world.